Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everybody here to the October 1st, 2024 AM Board of Supervisors meeting. And before we call the meeting to order, um, we have our invocation and then Pledge of Allegiance. And this morning, we have the uh, distinct privilege of uh, welcoming, welcoming Mr. R.E. Dean, who is the chaplain for Company One Fire Department, the VFW, and the Lions Club, uh, um, a true staple of Culpeper County. So if you would please stand for the invocation and remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Dean. Almighty God, we thank you for this day. Father, we thank you for this Board of Supervisors that put forth great effort to make our town and county a better place in which to live. We ask your guidance upon them for this morning's session and for this session tonight. We know that they have a hard task and a lot of people do not agree, but we know that you will guide them to give them the best knowledge that we need. Thank you for those that are behind the scenes that help make Culpeper a most pleasant situation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Mr. Dean. I'd now like to call to order the October 1st, 2024 AM Board of Supervisors meeting and ask Supervisor uh, Underwood if he'd lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. First order of a, a business this morning is going to be the approval of the agenda. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Move to approval. Moving as moving forward as presented. Item 2.02 .02 is our consent agenda. Are there any additions or deletions to the consent agenda? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, for the ten, the minutes, uh, the 10 a.m. minutes of the Board of Supervisors meeting, I ask under old business that it be revised to note that there was staff presentation, uh, a motion made by Supervisor Gagino, then discussion, then the 5 1 vote. Salas. Otherwise, I move for approval. All right. Um, all those in favor of uh, approving the consent agenda? So you need a second. A se uh, what that was. Second. Well, okay. Did he did he make the motion? I made the motion. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> all in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, <laughs> moving on to item 3.0, county general county business. There is none. Um, 4.0, our old business, there is none. Um, item 5.0, new business, um, the board will consider authorizing the county attorney to sign a declaration letter to the FAA for unmanned aircraft program for the Culpeper County Sheriff's Office. And with this, I'll turn it over to our county administrator to introduce this item. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, members of the board. Rolling right along this morning. I didn't even have to read the consent agenda. <laughs> well, that's a mess up. That, that, no, no, no need. Um, th this item under doing business is, is basically just a letter of support um, that the county attorney has drafted uh, f at the request of the sheriff's office. They are seeking to implement an unmanned aircraft or drone program, and uh, <clears throat> that does require some support from the local governing body. Sheriff Chilton's here if you'd like to learn a little bit more about what this program entails. Um, and there's a, a, that letter of support from the county attorney is included on board docs. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, board. Um, we ha I have First Sergeant Jason Clark here with me. He's gonna be in charge of the drone program. But um, I guess the first part that we wanted to make sure everybody knew of that the drones had been purchased already. We have 10, I believe, uh, in-house and we also bought them with savings from the uh, outside jail sources. So it was uh, something we didn't have to ask for. We didn't have to come to the board for extra money. We were able to find that money in our extra savings throughout it. As you know, most of the drone programs that's come, uh, come up in, in policing, policing has changed and obviously the technology's changed. So technology in policing is changed. And that's what we put together for, uh, for you guys just to see a little short program of what we're looking for. I think the biggest thing for, for Ms. Weimer is she's put the support letter together for us to have this program, and it's basically for licensing and um, certifications is what we're looking to kind of show you guys. 
Good morning. I'll be brief. I know that y'all have the presentation in front of you. When, you. when you have it later on, you can go through it, so I'm not going to waste your time going over every slide. But what I wanted to explain to you is what we're going to try to obtain with this letter, which is the first step to get what's called a certification of authenticity or a waiver through, through the FAA. Uh, there's two ways that you can fly a drone that you're supposed to, unless you're doing it recreation where you just buy your child a drone and they just go up and play with it. Uh, the other way is called a Part 107 to where the pilots actually have to take a test. Um, when we go to it, when, the, when you take this test, it's um, a lot of times it's about an hour long test that you have to go at the airport and actually do it in, at an FAA center. Um, the other way is to do a COA, which is what we're actually applying for. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually merge the two together. We're gonna do the COA that'll cover the office and cover the officer, but now we're gonna have all our pilots get a part 107. By doing a COA and going through the FAA route, it proves that we are, uh, all our planes are airworthiness and safe and that all our pilots are, know what they're doing and actually can handle it. And then they also give us a lot of the waivers to flying over at night and also flying over crowds as well. So it's gonna save us a lot of time in the long run. Uh, just a quick introduction, like I said, I'm not gonna waste a lot of your time. You're gonna hear UAS or drone, which is just an unmanned aircraft system. So for the FAA, they consider a drone an aircraft and so they also consider you as driving it and flying it with the controller as a pilot so a lot of the times what you're going to see um, people will call a lot we get them a lot of times at the sheriff's office hey i got a i have a drone flying over my property can i just shoot it down no you can't because it's actually considered an airplane and it's actually a violation it's a first class misdemeanor and i'll just hit you with those real fast so that's where we're at there's the code for it it's destruction of an aircraft are you interfering with an aircraft so a lot of times when what we're seeing uh, when we do some of these uh, drone activities, uh, especially if we're on a manhunt or something along those lines, we actually have to have somebody watch the pilot so nobody interferes because it's actually against the law to interfere with the pilot as they're operating with that plane because that plane could come down and fall on somebody or take out property and cause damage. Um, in, your, in your presentation, you're gonna see a whole bunch of Virginia codes. Uh, just as new technology comes in, so does the code of Virginia to catch up with the law. So the codes that are in there and all have been in there since about 2018. They've only had slight variation, uh, some as reason, uh, recent as this year in some of the codes, and that's just been minor changes, but they're all pretty much the same where it's a class one misdemeanor if you interfere with uh, flying over a pilot. Um, like I said, I'm not going to go through all that for you, but it is there for y'all to have it to look. Uh, what I wanted to show you is what we're seeing that we're doing a lot of the use for the drones, our capabilities. When we do this, we're not just thinking about law enforcement. So this is the capability for all law enforcement. But what we're actually planning to do, the sheriff's going to allow us to work with other agencies and around the county and also other entities within the county. Uh, we'll be able to support the fire and rescue. Uh, y'all know a couple months ago we had the big fire that out there that we had out in the county. A lot of the drones from, I think, Falk here actually came out and helped, as well as the town came out and flew out to help. We're able to fly up over, over, the, fly, over the fire area and show the firefighters still where there's a lot of heat and a lot of and help coordinate their attack on the fire. We'll be able to help do that with brush fires. We'll also be able to help out GIS when it comes to, with everything that we're having now with the hurricane, if we ever get into any sort of flooding or erosions, we'll be able to fly over and help map the area for them so they can actually see where there is some erosions around riverbanks. And this is all the stuff the sheriff is willing for us to help and help do that with the county, along with our other duties that we have for law enforcement, which would be the, um, that we're used to, the barricades and so forth. The, the planes that are the drones that we do currently have now, we have two of the larger payload drones, which carry zoom lenses which will be really in depth and have a lot of detail when you go into zooms for man hunts. Those drones fly for about 45 minutes to 50 minutes, depending on the wind that's out there and also the sort of movement. Uh, we also purchased four drones that have a lower capable thermo, uh, thermal imaging and also zoom lens that we're hoping to implement by putting one in each car for each of the shifts. So if we automatically have a missing child, that pilot will then go to the scene as well and start shooting, going straight up in the air and start surrounding the area to looking for that child that may be lost and while other resources come in. So are there any questions or anything? I know this is real fast, but like I said, we're not here asking for the funding. We're just asking for the letter to start the phase, which is the first 
uh, step of the COA. Yes, sir. So the ultimate goal would be to have how many pilots I would love certified to have and, then, and then how many drones operational? I would love to have as many pilots as available. Right now we had a request and we have actually uh, 12 people that are going to become pilots that are with our office. Uh, an idea that we had when the sheriff is all aboard, we're not going to open it up just to the deputies. Our dispatchers are allowed, our jail staff is allowed, and our civilian staff is allowed to help operate it. And by doing that, we actually spread out our resources. Since I'm in CID, if I'm flying and it's a major crime scene, I may be pulled away to go handle the crime scene and won't be able to fly. But since we're opening it up to civilian staff as well, because they're going to be part of this training, they're going to have a Part 107 license as well, they'll be able to fly. For the drones uh, that we're going right now, I would love for every, every officer to eventually have a drone. I think the future is probably going to be to where they're probably going to come out of the cars eventually and send in. But for right now, we have the four drones that we've already purchased, so that's going to be one for each shift so that it, it's kind of like a canine officer. You know, if we know we're having that sort of scenario to where a drone can fly over for the missing child or for the hostage negotiate, for the barricade situation, they'll just be en route and there to help. All right. So, sorry, <laughs> sounds like a robust, uh, all-inclusive program. Terrific. Yes, sir, and, yeah. and we're trying, and what we're trying to do is to start it off right instead of just going out there and just flying and getting a part 107, we want to do it completely well. We want to be on board with the FAA because we know they all own the space above our, our, the ground. So we're trying to work with them so that we can have, do the right thing at the beginning and keep it going. All right. Only minor clarification, they may control it, they don't own it. Yes, sir. But, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm all for property rights. Yes, sir. Yes, and sir. <laughs> in terms of that, uh, one, I very much similar to uh, Supervisor Lee, I appreciate you all going through both the COA and the 107, doing it in conjunction makes sense to me. Yes, sir. Uh, and so I'm supportive of the letter. I am concerned about overregulation relative to the FAA. So there are issues where we're falling behind other countries because of that. And uh, I hope that we become more progressive along those lines. But once again, support of the letter. Thank yes, you. Sir. Thank you all very much. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that the board uh, authorizes the county attorney to sign a declaration letter uh, to the FFA for an unmanned aircraft program for the Culpeper County Sheriff's Office. Second. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries, Ms. Ellis. Thank you all for your Thank time. you. John, should we go back on that um, consent agenda? No, sir. It's Maybe not necessary to be read. Okay. All right. Well, moving on to item 6.0, our committee reports. Um, first, Supervisor Underwood. Uh, we didn't meet, sir. Uh, Supervisor Durr, Buildings and Grounds. Mr. Chairman, the committee brings forward a motion that the board award a contract to Duval LLC to install a permeable paver parking lot and associated stormwater water bioretention facility at the Carver Center. Second. Motion and a second discussion. And I don't know if this, um, Mr. Howard wants to elaborate on this or. If the board wants to learn more about it, Mr. Howard has the details. It looks reasonable, price is good, let's go. All right, we have a motion and a second. All in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Moving on to rules committee, Ms. Cugino. Mr. Chairman, the committee brings forward for discussion the consideration of amendments to Chapter 9 miscellaneous offenses and provisions of the County Code, specifically Article 3 regulations of open fires. Second, but it would be good to have some discussion on this one or explanation. Yes. Then I don't second. I'm all for it, though. <laughs> I'll make it. Go ahead, John. If you um, you, Mr. Chairman, I guess I would ask Sam to, to come forward if he doesn't mind. Um, this came out of, of rules without a motion. Um, the amendments we're talking about here are probably fairly minor. I think Sam would agree with that. And they can be drafted and authorized to, uh, today to move forward to a public hearing, or, or we can take them back to bring them back to the board next month once they're actually drafted before you take the public hearing step. It's uh, 
really up to you. Sam. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, yeah, this particular code section exists today, chapter, chapter nine of the county code. It's not a zoning ordinance, uh, but it's part of the county code. Um, many sections of the uh, county code identify a lead enforcement agency, whether it's the zoning administrator, the sheriff, or some other county department. This particular code section does not identify that office, so it's caused some confusion over the years on who's supposed to be in charge of enforcing some of the regulations that you see related to fires, especially regulation open fires. Staff, uh, at least my opinion, uh, moving forward, I think it would, uh, would suit the board to adopt or clarify and code and actually adopt an enforcement section to identify that lead agency for this. Um, we have that in other chapters. Um, on the screen there, it's labeled section 10A-5 as an example of what that could look like um, and probably should be in this code section somewhere in chapter nine as well. Um, and it's a simple uh, verbiage, but it just establishes a contact point and who's supposed to be in charge of enforcing the ordinance um, or code. Um, basically reads the provision of this chapter shall be enforced by the Culpeper County Sheriff or his deputies or by the Culpeper County Zoning Administrator. This particular case with regulation of open fires, our office, the zoning office does get calls a lot. I'm sure the sheriff gets even more. Um, and through the uh, 911 office, I'm sure at times as well. So this particular ordinance, I think it's more geared towards someone that can be mobile quickly, um, in my opinion. Um, our office does not have that mobility um, currently. Um, it would be more geared towards the sheriff's office duties, in my opinion. Uh, the sheriff is here. We have not discussed in great detail um, any potential changes, so that may require further discussion there um, as well as we move forward. And I believe that captures kind of the discussion that the Rules Committee had, um, but I'm happy to, to elaborate further if needed. So. Questions for Sam? So, so why is this being brought up now? Uh, it's, it's, it's something that probably uh, Supervisor Underwood should have been addressed a long time ago. Um, it's just for clarification purposes of basically who's supposed to be in charge when we have an issue or a concern or a complaint. Um, right now, there's, there's not a lead agency for that. Our office will send out letters, usually courtesy letters, explaining you know, the ordinance, and then that kind of ends our authority today. But it's not even clearly addressed that we should be the ones initiating that. So. that. That makes sense. I would just note that there, uh, I believe the objective is not to clamp down on open fires during right. periods that it's right. permitted, but that there may be some serial uh, abusers that are burning things that are not good for surrounding neighborhoods and people and that uh, yeah. therefore that's leading to some complaints there have been some in the Salem district some in other districts yeah. and uh, having an enforcement mechanism to protect the health safety and welfare would be worthwhile yeah and supervisor Underwood, I wouldn't propose that necessarily any changes unless the board wanted to change actual substance matter of the code um, I believe that it does work. There's setbacks. There's yeah. different things involved that, that have been there for years, um, it's, and we're not proposing to change any of that. It's just simply to add basically an enforcement identifier or, you know, agency. So, right. Thank you. Well, Sam, I think part of that would be a staffing problem, too, with the number of staff that you have um, versus the sheriff's office. I think that's... Uh, as a county I'll certainly let the sheriff address the sheriff that like um, for himself, uh, yeah. but from my, from my standpoint, uh, the, the planning and zoning office, yes, we do have, you know, limited staff that would be able to, to at least Johnny on the spot go address an issue, you know, and, and address thing if it, were, if it were the case that we needed to. Letter writing, we're good at that. We've been doing that for years. Um, you know, we, we can certainly assist the sheriff as needed with, uh, you know, letters that go out to, to landowners just to, you know, make them aware of an ordinance, um, things like that, so. Um, sure. Sheriff. Sheriff obviously has something to want to say. This is the part where I'm <laughs> supposed to come ask for like six or eight more deputies real quick, so I'm going to throw that, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw that piece in there real fast. But um, I think for us was the benefit for the arm, enforcement arm, and dealing with Sheila and, and some of the other, especially uh, Mr. Rosenberg, on different pieces in his district. But I think for us was, was having the ability to, to make some, some uh, enforcement to it. We were we had DEQ complaints. We had um, we had probably six or eight different um, citizens in the office, and it was exactly what uh, Supervisor Underwood was saying. He there is this the serial 
people that are burning things that they're not supposed to, and, and that's given us the ability to do things. We have a current situation that's it's in DEQ, it's at the Attorney General's office right now, and we don't really have anything to do with it. We, we couldn't do anything, we were, we were um, kind of handcuffed by a uh, court order. So that's where we're sitting, and I think this will, will help us right after you give us the six or eight more deputies. <laughs> <laughs> Chairman, that's all I have. I'm happy to entertain any questions. It would need, we would need to make any code changes um, unless the county attorney thinks otherwise that we would need to still have a public hearing for this. It doesn't need to be referred to the Planning Commission because it's not a zoning text amendment, uh, but the board would need to have a public hearing. So. More questions for Sam? Entertain a motion. Mr. Chairman, I move that we uh, direct Sam to make the update for the enforcement in this code and advertise a public hearing to do so. And right. I believe, Sam, there was also another open fire type line item somewhere else that would make sense over here, and I don't believe that needs a public hearing, but should we do it at the same time? There may be a structural change to the code. There's another section that seems to be out of order um, in the code that addresses fires as well. Um, and I would suggest that that structural change be made with this. It, there again, it's not a, I don't think it's a substance change, uh, but it would be more of a structural change inside the actual chapter. Okay. But it would, would require a public hearing to do any of those things, so. Okay. I'll Chairman, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I second of the uh, motion. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Thank Thanks, you, Mr. Chairman. Moving on now to our economic development report. Mr. Rothmel will give us the uh, current report. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this is a uh, the best month, Winona will be handling the farm tour update. Just want to let you know, uh, we really enjoyed our time in Denver at IEDC, uh, the International Economic Development Conference. We did not win the grand prize, still honored to get gold. Uh, we lost to a $22 million renovation of a courthouse project. Um, you know, Choose Cold River Farms is a $5,000 budget. So it just kind of goes to show you where the, the, um, the competition was very stiff uh, for that. So anyway, appreciate your support. And Winona will give you the farm tour update. Good morning, everybody. Um, so just a quick recap of this year's farm tour. Um, we are also gonna explain a little bit of how from our strategic plan, we are working on continuing this communication with our agricultural community, as well as um, identifying some new ways to shoulder programming around our tent pole event. So this year's event was held Saturday and Sunday, September 21st and 22nd. It included 10 participating farms and ag locations. Um, two new farms joined us this year, Cornerstone Horsemanship, as well as Oak Shade Farm. Um, we had an estimated visitor count of just under 2,000. 62% of visitors this year were Culpeper County residents. So one of the big things that we've been working on over the last two years, including with the launch of Choose Culpeper Farms, is really targeting our residents here in the county, as well as those in the directly surrounding counties. We're really hoping to build relationships between our residents and these farms so that outside of just the farm tour, they're able to go out and visit these farms. Um, and have a little bit more of an economic impact outside of just the event. So we're really excited to see that 62% of the visitors were residents of Culpeper County. Um, additionally, as of the time of the report, it was 17%. Um, it's up to 22% of visitors um, were directly surrounding counties as well. Uh, we did get to share some additional information from the most recent Ag Census report. We had some figures related to farming, uh, the economic impact it has on our community uh, shared at our Welcome Center. And we had an estimated economic impact. It's up to 355,000 currently. As a reminder, these are self-reported numbers. So this is spending based off of what our visitors have reported to us that they spent. We do also follow up with all of our farms after the event to make sure that we um, identify any way that we can improve the event moving forward. One of the things that we heard um, from Paul, he's the owner of Windmill Heights Garden Center, he did see an increase of 50% um, for sales 
in compared to a typical weekend this time of the year. So we're really excited to see that. Um, some of the other things that we heard, again, were that we had lots of um, residents and new farm tour visitors. So we are looking to integrate Choose Culpepper Farms. Again, Farm Tour is now a program of Choose Culpepper Farms, so we wanna make sure that we're bringing recognition to that program because it is relatively new still. So one of the things that we did is we invited additional farms out to our Welcome Center to participate in what we call our Culpeper Farm Corner. This is an opportunity for additional farms to sell their products or get their um, name out there and talk about their operations to the hundreds of visitors that we're having out at the uh, Welcome Center. So this year we had five farms participate in that farm corner. We had great um, responses and um, all of our farms that were selling products stated that they did, um, they were really happy with the sales that they received at that event. We also partnered with the Extension Office for Culpeper to be able to spotlight 4-H programming at the farm tour. So we hosted the Extension Office um, at the Welcome Center to share information about the 4-H programs. This is in addition to what the Extension Office is doing out at the Carper Center. So we had 4-H students showcasing animals at the Welcome Center and we, um, they also provided interactive displays for visitors. Additionally, we uh, welcomed CFC Farm and Home Center on to the tour on Saturday. They are closed on Sunday, so they participated with us on Saturday. They had FFA um, students from both middle schools out there talking about their programs. Um, they also had a fundraising bake sale and they raised over $1,000 for those middle school programs. Additionally, um, through both the Welcome Center and our passport or our brochure, um, we promoted Choose Culpepper Farms. We did include information that is available on our website that um, included information on some of our ag-focused community groups um, and promoting the website in general. Again, this is to drive traffic to that website outside of just the farm tour to make sure that people um, are able to see where they can kind of interact with our farms throughout the year, whether that be through events or where they can purchase fresh products um, from our farms. We also highlighted sips of cold pepper in the farm tour brochure. Again, this is our beverage exploration trail um, that launched in April, so we're excited to be able to promote um, that through the brochure as well. Um, one last thing not included in here, I did also just want to extend a thank you to our Parks and Rec Department. They assisted with the delivery of some of our items um, and they were a big help, so I just wanted to say thank you to them and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Will the 4-H programs, is that going to continue in the future yes. for our farm tours? Mm -hmm. Have the spotlighted? I'm sorry? I'm sorry, spotlighting the 4-H the, the, the programs. Yes, was, they were happy to be out there, so yep. we will make sure that we include them again in the Terrific, the, all right, thank years. you. Yep. Any other questions? I wanna thank you for another great job. I went around to a bunch of the different areas and it is always a blast and Reagan absolutely loved it. So good job and thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you. Next up is our administrator's report. John. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a, a couple of, of little housekeeping things before I get to the actual item I listed on the agenda. Um, first, we talked to, about having a meeting with our legislators and uh, at their request and, and their own coordination, um, the date that's set is Wednesday, November 20th at 10 a.m. at SeaTech, and that will include uh, Weber, Reeves, and Freitas. So we got all three of them coming. If you can make it, that'll be great. Um, and certainly we'll send out a reminder to you, but I just learned that information this morning, so wanted to share that with you today. Uh, secondly, uh, VACO comes up in November, actually the week before that legislative gathering, um, and they have asked us uh, to, again, uh, indicate who will have voting credentials for the county. I believe last year it was Chairman Bates. Just wanted to confirm whether we want to stick with that or uh, whether you have any other direction for staff. Sounds good. Absolutely. I think you're it, Mr. Chairman. The last thing uh, that I wanted to share that I listed on the agenda was a grant funding summary. And I just wanted to, to read you a few facts and figures um, 
Today is October 1st, 2024. On October 1st of 2017, uh, we hired Laura Loveday to fill, fill a newly created position called Special Projects and Grants Administrator. And since that time in 2017, seven years ago, uh, Laura has, has garnered $16,820,000 in change uh, in grant funding for Culpeper County. We have another million dollars this year that are currently awaiting award announcement. Uh, she has submitted for 113 opportunities during that span, 80 of which have been successful. Uh, some of the projects we've secured have assisted with fire and rescue, emergency services, the sheriff's office, the schools, parks and rec options, the library, human services, and uh, community development, just to name a few things. Uh, this year alone, we're funding, funding uh, a couple of our uh, school resource officer positions in the schools. We've uh, purchased equipment for the sheriff's office. We're building ADA accessible trails at Len Park, making substantial additions and renovations at the Carver Center, uh, providing peer responders for opioid uh, use disorder, and providing free recreational fitness opportunities throughout the county in various places. So uh, with all that said, Laura in her time here is averaging $2.4 million in grants a year. And I just really wanted to bring that to the attention of the board and the public. So congratulations, Laura. I too would just like to say thank you. It's, um, that's all. Mr. Chairman. I'd like to add to that, I help with several nonprofits. The food closet would be one that comes to mind. And I know that they have talked with Laura and she has helped them to apply for grants. So all of her abilities aren't focused just here. She's helping other organizations in the county and that's much appreciated. Thank you again. <clears throat> That, moving on to item 9.0, I'll entertain a motion to go into closed session. Mr. Chairman, I move we enter into closed meeting as permitted under Virginia Code Annotated Section 2.2-3711A368, and 29 to discuss and consider, one, the potential purchase of real properties located in Stevensburg and Cedar Mountain districts, or the discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the bargaining position, negotiating strategy, and financial interest of the county slash board. Two, the acquisition of real property, a jail facility, the award of a public contract, and the investment of public funds therein, where discussion in an open meeting would adversely affect the financial interest, bargaining position, and or negotiating strategy of the board if made public initially. Second. Motion and second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. We're in closed session, thank you all.